representative here from the flag. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, a little round of applause. So he won't come again. He says he's bribable, so we want Yeah. Him. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, um, Terry's presentations are always a treat, as um, well, we all know, and you might not know, but Terry is in charge of the. Um, large marketing for his new paper and while it, that would leave the rest of us dishevelled and exhausted, he even is not only does he teach it well but he actually investigates and he does research around it and he's writing to new tech events. So I'm really looking forward to perhaps learning plenty today. So thanks Terry. Oh, thanks. Well, straight away of this presentation I was faced with a dilemma because even though my name appears at the front of the na list of names there, it's actually, it should be at the end of a very, very long list of names because I'm to say I'm a bit player is probably a little bit overplaying my involvement in this project. But um, part of the project uh, is about disseminating and uh, sharing with others uh, the development of this tool. And uh, that's really my aim here today, is to sort of give you a bit of an insight into this uh, creative problem solving tool that's been developed uh, for students. It's been, oh no, I'm getting ahead of myself. So just over Overview is just going to look at sort of a bit of a background uh, and then I'll demonstrate the tool and then we'll just look at some early student feedback that we've got and some early teacher feedback because this is a tool that's not just so just so just overview over is just going to look at sort of a bit of a background uh, and then I'll demonstrate the tool and then we'll just look at some early student feedback that we've got and some early teacher feedback because this is a tool that's not just designed for students but it's um, been designed as a sort of a uh, Moodle cartridge uh, that can be uploaded into any sort of uh, Moodle course so for our stream. And then I'll actually be getting asking for your feedback because as uh, many of you are lecturers, uh, you want feedback on this tool and how it might or might not fit into your courses. Uh, one of the inputs into the project as well. So you've, some of you may have come across this chap, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, he's been a talker, advisor, speaker and researcher in respect to creativity and education for quite some time. Uh, he's got some very strong views on the role of creativity in education and some of them are that creativity, he defines it as a process of having original ideas that have value. He says, uh, genuine creative processes involve critical thinking as well as imaginative insights and fresh ideas. That creativity without uh, critical uh, thinking abilities is, is rather um, of less value. Uh, that you can't be creative if you don't do something. So creativity is applied to something. It's not, it's not, it's not this kind of cloud that follows a person around. Uh, it's something that's applied. And, an, oh, typo already. The central bit of every creative process is, is evaluation. And this is something we'll touch on when we look at the tool. Uh, does it feel right? Does it work? So it's an actual aspect of uh, creative process. Is that your career? Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I'm starting a new language. Uh, that creativity is actually a disciplined uh, path of daily education, that there's a discipline involved in creativity and with various frameworks we can sort of capture this discipline and we can use that discipline to, uh, to encourage our students to think creatively. Uh, that everybody has a tremendous <laughs> creative ability. Some people, you know, you'll talk to someone and say, oh, I haven't got a creative bone in my body. The reality is creativity is not something you're born with. Uh, you can actually learn uh, to be creative. You can be encouraged to be more creative than you would have been otherwise uh, with the right sort of tools. Uh, so it's not sort of the domain of these elite special people and it's also not the domain of arts and crafts and, and uh, music and the like. It's creativity can be applied uh, just about to any task. And most importantly that you can teach creativity. Uh, but there's a proviso there, and our friend Mr. Robinson, the reason why he's so famous is he, he did a TED talk in Monterey in 2006, which uh, spread his uh, infamy quite far and wide. And the, the nut of his uh, little 19 minute presentation was uh, that we slowly 
he rode away uh, children's creative ability. Uh, one of his bugbearers is particularly uh, been based in the UK mostly, is standardised testing. And uh, basically that, you know, through uh, the fact that we're trying to assess and evaluate and test and test and test, uh, we basically just take away uh, the joys of creativity from our children and that just progresses up through, the, basically they become conditioned to not take risks, to not actually revel in making mistakes because of course we mark mistakes wrong. <laughs> So, you know, there's an encouragement for one right answer rather than uh, a, a set of possible answers. So uh, he, he's had a lot to say about it, and it's, and it's uh, certainly uh, encouraged a lot of other people to think of it. He sees that there's a, a need for creativity, that it's not just something that's interesting to talk about. Given that the future is now becoming increasingly more difficult to predict, in respect to the types of jobs our students will be doing uh, in five years, let alone 10 years or 15 years, and or let alone even when you know, they're sort of in their 50s. Uh, we can provide them with lots of institutional knowledge and understanding uh, of some current concepts, but without creativity, then they're not, without that, and that ability to critically think, they're not able to sort of, you know, they're gonna be less prepared uh, to deal with whatever the future is going to throw at them. And this has also been picked up by a few people and the reason this project started in Australia is that there was a um, Australia 2020 summit and creativity came through very strongly in respect to that. And uh, a number of projects uh, came out of, out of the summit uh, that addressed creativity. So, oh sorry. Getting ahead of myself again. So, while many universities acknowledge the importance of creativity um, in terms of having programs structured around achieving certain graduate qualities, basically uh, the qualities that they expose sort of elevate traditional um, education methodologies and practice. And it's just based on knowledge acquisition and retention rather than creativity. So, a lot of the curriculum doesn't explicitly uh, deal with creativity, but we have an understanding that when a student leaves the university that they need to be able to creatively approach tasks given the knowledge that you've imparted with them. So Mesa University is no different to the rest. Um, our little, what are we calling it? We're about to call it. Yeah, 2025, row 20 to 20. Uh, we talk about um, our values and into it and I create and innovate. And yet outside of design uh, and the arts, there's very little attention, if any attention, uh, paid to uh, creativity. In fact, you know, in lots of ways, and I'm as bad as anyone else, in lots of ways we kind of subdue it because we're, we are looking for answers, one right answers, and very rarely do we get the opportunity, except for so papers such as PAMS, where the students are able to go out and actually come up with a unique um, solution to a problem. Now, um, the Office of Learning and Training in Australia, formerly called the Australian Learning Teaching Council, funded a number of projects after the, uh, after the 2020 um, conference and uh, that addressed creativity just at simply at a disciplinary level. So there's some for the arts, uh, some for design. I think Create Ed was a design um, initiative. So they're very sort of based on specific disciplines. But no project specifically addressed um, the need for a, a framework and support system to guide academics. So to help academics who might want to bring creativity into the, uh, their course. And certainly nothing across a range of disciplines and nothing addressed the development of a curricula uh, where creativity was embedded, okay, to facilitate learner engagement and creative problem solving. So none of them particularly addressed that. Around the same time, the two, uh, the three key people behind the project, uh, Ron Corso and Stuart Gluth, uh, a couple of design lecturers in the School of Art and Architecture and Design at the University of South Australia, a couple of very charismatic young guys, well, we're young, not so young now. But they 
basically went through this routine together. It was kind of like a, a very abstract routine, and it was something that was part of the tool to begin with, was a video trying to capture this routine of theirs, whereby they really abstract the whole uh, approach to trying to find a creative um, solution to designing a new product. And they went through this example of a chair, trying to imagine what a chair is. Can you think of any number of different chairs? And anyway, they've been doing this for a few years. And around the same time, Denise Wood was um, teaching a media studies a first year paper. And she was looking at ways of trying to further engage students in the process. And she had this real problem that they weren't being particularly creative in what should have been a rather creative paper. Anyway, she went along and saw Ron and Course, Ron Course and Stuart doing their thing and thought, well, you know, there's something there which we might be able to, we could sort of package them up and be able to share them around. We, we could sort of have something. So that was the genesis of, of the whole thing. And uh, they did it, they, they got a little grant uh, from UniSA, teaching and learning grant, which uh, started to think about forming a framework and maybe thinking about developing a tool. Uh, then they decided that they were going to apply for a big um, ALTC funded project. Uh, involved of University of South Australia, RMIT, uh, James Cook University and University of North New England and uh, Massey University were involved too. Uh, so that was back in 2010 that was put together and basically the idea of involving all the universities was really to one, get people who are interested in, in creating such a tool together and, and uh, sort of getting everyone's ideas together and trying to develop the best possible tool and the most um, widely applicable tool, uh, but also to trial the tool, so to actually use it in courses and then get some feedback from the students and also get some feedback from the lecturers who are involved in that as well. And then hopefully at the end, we'd end up with something quite worthwhile. Uh, Massey's involvement was largely uh, as a result of Ingrid Day uh, coming out of the same uh, school as Denise Wood, so there was a connection there. She saw some value in the tool being applied at Massey. Uh, I got brought in at the beginning of last year, so very late in the process. Originally the project was only going to go to 2012. Now, I wasn't responsible for the extension, but uh, I, it was basically the 11th hour that I started to become involved, uh, and that was as a result of Robin Walker, and uh, she, she'd been brought into the project. She hadn't managed to organise any courses to trial it, and uh, of course she was retiring and she really didn't see that there was much value for her to continue, so she passed it on to me, thinking that I might be interested, at which point I tried to organise a few courses uh, to trial the tool. Uh, being PBRF year, it was a bit of a difficult process, and it, by that time it was about April or May. But Massey is still involved and in, in part, of, part of the project. Some of the project deliverables, there were quite a few. Um, a fully developed framework for curricular renewal designed to strengthen creative problem solving across a range of disciplines, so not just for architecture and design. It's been trialled in the health sciences, uh, entrepreneurship, marketing, uh, management, architectural design of course, media studies, engineering, uh, it's been trialled across a, a wide range of disciplines. And also to create a supporting open source uh, Moodle cartridge uh, of the system. Now the system that I'm going to show you shortly, it's, it's online and so that'll be basically translated into something that you can have up, upload to Moodle for students to use. And then of course you could change it to suit your needs if need be. Uh, the framework's based on um, this chap who I had to look up how to say. That's a tough one, but uh, bear with me. I did look it up, and I can tell you it is Cheat Sent Me Hai. <laughs> is, is, uh, he's the, if you've ever come across the concept of flow, he's the man who termed the word flow. Uh, he, he basically has an idea of a systems approach to creativity. Uh, basically, a framework needs to optimise opportunities for learners to exercise both, both divergent and convergent uh, thinking, to take risks, uh, evaluate decisions, so that links back quite nicely to some of the things Ken, was, Ken Robinson was talking about, uh, being able to synthesise new and existing information and hopefully arrive at a, an optimal <coughs> outcome, but at the same time while trying to maximise the opportunities 
for learning to become its its own reward. And this is the you know being in the flow that sort of concept there. Uh, this also has its roots Osborne and Parnes back in. I think it's 1953 uh, developed a bit of a CPS model uh, that had basically three major stages. Uh, was uh, ex first stage was exploring the challenge, second stage generating ideas, and the third stage preparing for action. And the whole what's carried over into later versions of, of creative problem solving tools is that it's a cyclic process rather than just a straight linear process. Uh, Torrance in '78. Uh, he used CPS for the development of educational materials. Uh, Titus, uh, a marketing lecturer by chance, uh, devoted a, uh, created a, a creative problem solving tool for the marketing curriculum. And his has about six stages to it, as you'll see uh, in Genium's up down to five. Um, Amy O'Bull's uh, confidential framework of creativity was also used, and she basically breaks down into three components that there's a dominant relevant skills, creativity relevant process and task motivation. That's been blended into the tool and that is completely beyond my understanding of education. But um, I'm assured that that's uh, all been taken into account. So let's have a quick look at this. I'm going to have to do a bit of a switcheroo because that's not going to work. Right. So this is Ingenium, the tool that's available on the web at the moment, and its latest version. So basic, we have a basic structure here where students work through each of the stages. So it, there's been a number of titles, and as a result of student feedback and teacher feedback, they've been changed bit by bit. Uh, so the first stage is what's the big picture? Second stage, generating ideas. Third stage, what do others know? Fourth is the problem solved. And five, what's the new idea? Now, uh, people have actually used this tool for postgraduate study as well. So when people have been doing research, just encouraging them to, to go through the process of you know, sort of divergent thinking, thinking about you know, all the different ways you can approach the problem, see what others know, and then sort of reflecting and revising on the basis of that. So each stage has its own little bits and pieces. You've also got a few little aspects uh, resources to go with it. There's actually a mind mapping tool, and I'll just right. Mind mapping is just one part of it, and you won't see it because I won't log in just yet. But there's a tool there where you can create your own mind maps online. It, it's it's okay. I think it needs a little bit more work. Bubble Us is probably a better tool uh, that's available online in terms of mind mapping. So within each one of these, there's a bunch of uh, just textual suggestions about how they might approach it. Typically, uh, students aren't dropped straight into the tool that you'd do a presentation. Uh, for Pam's paper, I did a little bit of a presentation, tried to sort of uh, encapsulate a presentation I'd seen from Ron Corson and Stuart Bluth. But uh, you'd probably lead into it with some sort of explanation how this fits into the process, what your expectations are. So the student sort of goes through this, they get a few ideas. First thing is really about just sort of divergent thinking about really thinking broadly about what the problem is and what it might involve so that they don't overlook anything. Each of these is, is uh, also includes, and these are very popular with students, a little animation. Uh, we originally had, like I said, we had videos of uh, Ron and Stuart. They were, they were sort of quite creatively done, but they were just a little bit long winded, and plus they, they were forever using this chair chair abstract example and you know if you're talking to some marketing students then it's a little bit too far divorced from what you're doing. So I'll just quickly show you what this first one looks like. All right. Throughout these series of short videos we will show you how you can apply the ingenious tool to approach problem solving. To begin, give me a brief overview of the task you have been given. Okay, before we can complete the task we've been given, we need to spend time thinking about the assignment. 
This is a process of getting acquainted with the nature of the topic as well as its context. Begin by asking, what is the big picture here? The big picture scenario considers the broad issue and the problem. In your scenario, what is the problem that needs to be solved? For my assignment, the broad issue is community engagement and involvement. <coughs> the problem here is that downtown community garden want to recruit more members, but they don't have any way of reaching the local community. We need to come up with a new and creative way to attract new members, and they believe this can be done through the use of a short video. Okay. Looking at the wording of your assignment instructions, ask yourself, what are the key terms here? Write these down in your notes. Hmm. The key terms from the instructions are garden, community, volunteers, television, original, creative, video, internet. Great. Remember, at this early stage, we still need to think big picture. Think broadly about the task at hand. Don't try and think about solutions or how we will complete the assignment just yet. Before moving on to the next section, ask yourself, would the world be a better place if the problem were solved? <laughs> Write down the answer to this question. Would the world be a better place if this problem was solved? Well, for the community garden, it would be. They'd have a thriving garden and happy community. For potential new members, the world would also be a better place because they'd have a new hobby and they'd be sharing their time and skills with others. Great. Now that we have a stronger understanding of the problem, let's move on to generating ideas. So it actually jumps a little bit ahead of itself, actually, because um, within this one stage, there's actually some more questions that, are, that sort of basically probe the students to get them to sort of think, you know, for want of a better explanation, outside the square. So just, just sort of broadening their horizons about what the problem is, what might be involved, and what sort of aspects might be useful to sort of explore. So who, what, when, why, how and why. Um, you know, looking for analogies, similarities, um, looking for opposites, uh, looking for possibly some humorous aspects, and then what are they trying to achieve, so an objective. And so it just carries on in that process. There's, there's a lot of, uh, basically, so at this stage, uh, this sort of divergent thinking has been encouraged. Then generating ideas more divergent thinking. So open-ended divergent and imaginative thinking. Okay. So here uh, we start to sort of think about the mind map as one example. Uh, within there's also an idea generation section here where we actually where they can link up to um, creating minds org, which is a very good page. Um, and just a few suggested so absence thinking challenge scamper. Um, the six thinking hats, those sorts of approaches to just trying to be um, just yeah, divergent thinking. So again, there's a number of different pages. It's about encouraged to collaborate and reflect at various stages. So that the idea that there's this constant reflection and evaluation as they go through. Uh, and again, just trying to reinforce the idea that this is cyclic, so if they kind of get to a point and they reflect back and they feel as though they, they might have missed something, then they can carry on, go back and carry on again. Is yep. people working through this individually, always groups? Uh, it can, some people, in some, yeah, in some courses they've done it individually, uh, and others, yeah, it's been group work. And I, I think it, it probably works better in groups because the whole um, collaborating and reflecting process works much more. Uh, effectively than going across groups or across where people would end up probably doing the same thing rather than coming up with something unique. And again, videos at each and every stage, well not at each stage, but just about every stage, uh, 
and uh, they basically encapsulate what's what's there in the text. Um, at various times, it, it's expanded and got very wordy, and then sort of been drawn back together again. Uh, it's, it's still very text-based, but when you're trying to sort of explain and encourage different types of thinking, then it, you know it results in a fair amount of text. Uh, encouraging them to challenge assumptions, and then this whole idea of deconstructing and reconstructing the ideas that they've generated, and again, another opportunity to collaborate and reflect. Uh, then, what do others know? At one stage, uh, this was referred to as a lit literature review, and that's basically what we'd relate it to. Uh, that was taken away because it just basically seemed to put students off fairly quickly. But the essence of what's explained here is, is very much about finding more information that, um, about the issue or the uh, problems which they've highlighted. And uh, you know, and thinking like, who does this affect? Uh, what does it feel like to be in their position? So again, just sort of seeing it from from the organisation's perspective, and what sort of questions you might be able to ask, what you need from these people. So that's asking within the organisation. Then this is very much the literature review stage where you're saying, what do others already know? So that's looking outside of the organisation. More collaboration and reflection, and planning. I suppose in a um, teaching situation, the teacher could use this, so this was invisible to the students, but actually just... You could take them through the process. So they're yeah. they yeah. consulting this, what's next. Yeah, and, and that's one way to present the whole thing, and then maybe then saying the if, if you if you wanted to you know sort of do some further work on this, there's a tool available that you can go through in your own time, so that you know rather than you know have them hurriedly taking notes, they'd hopefully be listening and sort of taking the message in. Is, is there anything in a connection? Just thinking yep. back, um, about finding the information and finding what others know and the set the sources that they could use. Is there any link then to how to? find and evaluate sources of information um, that are valid or not valid for Yeah, them. not as part of part of the tool. But that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually an interesting point. That's something they need to find other information but not supporting them too. Yep. Right. So yeah. even there, I mean, you could modify it if you can change it to link to your... Well, if you brought this into, if, once it's in a little cartridge, you can bring it into your site and you could add that into it easy enough. Yeah. You can just, yeah, you could actually start to, you can put that in as an extra stage. It would be relatively straightforward and probably need a little bit of technical help. But, yeah. the, but the bones of the system are there and you can sort of tinker with it from, from there on. Because you want something like this where they can do it within this, not have to click away and open a new window. Yeah, window. ideally, because as soon as they move so off, then, links, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. They won't come back into where yep. they were. Yep. There is a website that's um, that's aligned with it. I'll just show that now. And this is a, a Facebook page. Um, Facebook is really big for, as a teaching tool um, in, um, in Australia, I've found. Uh, University of South Australia. Um, talk to them about Moodle. No, they, they've poured a lot of energy into Moodle there, and they've just had students completely dis dismiss it. They've had a major trouble getting students to engage in Moodle and uh, they've been really scratching their heads to try and get students to sort of discuss things and and <coughs> the students still sort of see it as an institutional nightmare and they just stay away and uh, um, a couple Ron Corso and Charlie Uh, his offsite, Charlie, is um, she's set up a site and it's actually works really, really well in tandem with the um, Ingenium tool. <coughs> a lot of students will go on there and say, "Oh, I've had this idea. Does anyone else know anything about it?" And lecturers and designers, and uh, because the tool's actually been used uh, in design uh, practices as well. And uh, design, they all get in there and they sort of add their little bit and sort of encourage, encourage the approach. And it's worked really, really well. So there's uh, 
few different little discussions. And of course they, they drop in little bits and pieces which may or may not apply at any one time for anyone, but it acts as a really good little resource as they sort of go through and look at the posts and see that there might be some something they can learn that they haven't picked up on already. So as you can see, it's a very creative and interesting <laughs> site. That's just there's stuff all over the place. So I mean, you, sometimes you have to sort of troll through and sort of wonder about how it's useful. But at the same time, it you really the exercise is about broadening people's horizons. So there's there's little harm to be had in being, sending students on there. Yep, and it's yeah, and it's solved their problem in respect to Moodle. They just can't get any buy in there. I suspect when they first set up Moodle there yeah, that they were very much along the uh, using the method of just basically using it as a dump site for information and uh, they've had a, yeah, a lot of difficulty coming coming back from that. So anyways, uh, fourth stage is the problem solved. Bit of information there about completing their task, getting them to think about how it might actually work out. More suggestions on how how to collaborate and reflect. And then the final, once they've got through to that stage, and also some suggestions that they might want to go back if they don't think they've solved the problem. And that's about the presentation of how, how they're going to present the solution. So that's again, it's just maybe suggesting that you not, might not necessarily just be producing a report, you might produce a video, uh, any number of an application. So ask, prompting them on who needs to see the results, which are the most appropriate platforms or formats for me to use to reach my target group. And there's two final stages to that, and then they end up with this very last one, which I'll just quickly give a little bit of a taste of that. Hope we've got sound. Share this new idea, thoughts, or approach with others and get their perspective on it. It's okay to continue to revise and improve your ideas at any time. Finally, reflect on your role in this problem-solving process. What did I do well? What could be improved? How will my research findings affect the world? Now you're free to go and complete your given task or assignment. Keep this process you've been through here in your mind as you're working. I don't think I've done enough research yet, but I have spent a good amount of time working through this creative problem-solving process, and I'm amazed that it worked so well. I'm glad I spent the time doing it. I've already said how the organisation's world will be changed, but my world will be changed too, because now I have this process that I can apply to almost any project I undertake. Very cool. Do they build into the critical thinking side of it? I mean, you can come up with new ideas and, you know, say, well, this is how we're going to solve the problem, but it yep. may actually not be a, a, a suitable solution or, or an effective solution or what have you. Yeah, and that's the role of the sort of domain knowledge, is that, you know, I mean, it's, you couldn't very well send a student off to do a marketing problem if they had no marketing knowledge. I mean, they may come up with a solution, but it, you know, it might be just completely of, of no value at all. So it's about applying that domain knowledge. So it's about this is about an application of uh, to a task, but the existing understanding and knowledge is really important. Plays a massive role. So that happens after this, does it? It's not built into this. Well, uh, to give you an example, I mean, if you're using it for say marketing planning, I mean, the idea there is that this this is all the knowledge has been imparted to the student. They've got an understanding, and then it's about applying. So. There's no reason why you can't if, if they you know, have a, uh, a section of the site where maybe if they could ask questions about any particular marketing concepts or anything like that. Uh, or you could have a knowledge base in which they could sort of dip into. Uh, you know, maybe have a knowledge hub for, for that curriculum where you know, they've got a resource at their, at their disposal as well. But ideally if you could link it together so there's less jumping around, mm. the better. One of the things I was thinking about usability, 
Um, and I mean, I have no idea how you design these things, so yep. it's probably way out there. But like for me, I'd like to be able to type in under those questions the thoughts that I'm thinking about. So rather than having a piece of paper off to the side, so mm -hmm. having like a connection to a one note type workbook or tool or something oh, okay. yeah. where the questions that are there, I'm just having to write on paper. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if I'm a student and I'm using that, and what does it look like to write down what is the big problem, which yeah. I mean isn't a major major, but if I could just type in what I was thinking as I went through each stage and it somehow stored it for me in a notebook, yeah. um, then that possibly would make it more useful. Because people diagrams, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. just something yeah. that's connecting me online, so I think, oh yeah, what's my question, it's this, what's this, it's this, without me having to have a notepad or another document open where I'm flicking back and forward between my Word document, or even like a, a workbook that accompanies this. Yeah. That the question Maybe something similar. Or... To, I mean, the mind mapping tool kind of fills that purpose, but yeah. it's it's but it's all about linkages. So in yeah. terms of writing that associated notes, it's not. So it could, it could be an, an accompanying. Yeah. Something where you have that open as well. So you've got Ingenium open here, and then your workbook open here. But the same questions are, are reproduced or replicated in there. Okay. Um, because I was thinking you're still having to. Right hand, write all those questions out on your notepaper, yeah. um, which is an extra stage that perhaps is. Yeah, and you're consuming. trying to you're trying to align a sort of a manual process yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. Your notebook would always be there. Yeah, yeah. so if you're typing yeah. stuff in and it's accumulating it for you, then you can print your notebook. Okay. And it's going to give you your processes. I mean, yeah. that's just. I mean, I, like obviously creating something like that's probably tricky. I don't know. No, I think I just probably the most difficult work. thing would be just storage space. Just blanking that so, that so they'd have to, you'd have, if, if you had it on Moodle, you could probably set something up with Moodle because mm -hmm. um, they'd be logging into it so that all their files would be stored on the server in that respect. And so, as a teacher, there's nothing here that I can assess the students have been through that whole process? No, but again, through Moodle, you, you would be able to just put tags on there so you could check track their activity. Yeah. Yep. But in its current form, it's just on the website. Yeah, so it's just an information source. Yep. That's taking me through a process that if I decide to follow it, and like you said, it, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's useful. Yep. I'm just thinking it's a bit more integration to the practical application of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, yes, required. Yeah. Excuse me, Terry, one more question if I may. Sure. The, the sequence of steps there, there's five steps, right? Are you, are you able to show those steps? Yep, sure. Because uh, the, was the solved problem solved was number four, and there's five steps. And what's the new idea? Why why are four and five that way yeah. around? Because I would have thought if the problem is the problem solved is the evaluator type thing, like you've got your idea. Yeah. Um, and then you'd critically analyze it, will it work, is it feasible, da 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 all that sort of stuff, you know, from a practical point of view. Um, whereas if you do that earlier on, is the problem solved? Yeah, we've generated all these ideas, we've solved the problem. Here's our ideas. But does it stop with the, you've got a solution, the creativity doesn't stop there, you surely don't ever stop adapting something, even if it's a solution at that point in time. Well, you've still got to apply it, don't you? Yep. I mean, otherwise it's just lots of talk. Well, I guess it's closing that loop up, isn't it? So it's yeah. cyclical and not just a, a linear process. So at that stage, it's asking them, do they think, have they, have they, come up with what they think is a suitable solution. But at various stages they've sort of gone out and, and got other people's opinions. And uh, so at that stage, if they don't think they've got the problem solved, then they're, they're instructed to basically start the process over again. And this is very much an action research cycle. Mm. Um, yep. And so maybe, yeah, maybe this site you could have like a, an image or something that shows the the cyclical the nature, yeah, because that's one of the criticisms that's come out is that the students think it's rather linear, so uh, it appears, it's presented that way and it's really difficult, how do you present something that has stages, as you know, a systems process uh, without it appearing linear, and yeah, you're right, if you had a kind of a circle whereby you could sort of had hot points where you could switch across between things if need be, then that might be. Okay. I was thinking about Mike's question. Mm. Yeah, the, I can see the, the reason that it's in that order. Yep. Um, because is the problem solved? You may have just come up with a solution that's it's already been out, out there. Yeah. Right? But you haven't actually come up with anything new. So this is a creative process. So at the end of this, you are looking for something different, something yep. new, something you creative. Need. So I can see that you can solve the problem, but not been creative. Right. You know, if yep. you think about it that way, you could have solved the problem but not been very creative in how you've done it. 
So the title's a little bit misleading in the sense that it's just suggests that there's this yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just about a solution yeah, rather than a creative solution. Come up with the same old but a solution that's already been tried. I mean, and this is where there's nothing new under the sun kind of stuff. Mm. But what this process is trying to do is to actually go one step further than that, saying how can we creatively solve this problem? What what new idea can we come up with? So I can I, I think I can understand why that may have put that as the fifth step. Yeah, okay. Fifth step. Yeah. Hey, are you only um, evaluating one solution at a time? Or are you actually weighing up different solutions uh, with each other? Well, in the generating ideas stage, you could imagine they come up with a number of different ideas. So, they yeah, they, just because they're, they're solving a problem doesn't mean that say that there's a single solution. Yeah. But I mean, you would imagine that the, the chances are that they're probably most students would be quite happy with one. Because if there was an interface to say line up all the possible solutions that you've come up with. Yeah. along with each other all on one page and then you know you've got them all in front of you and you can evaluate them pros and cons weighing up each other little one go yeah quite useful I think that collaboration and reflection stage is obviously really it seems to me to be very crucial because everyone when, when they're talking about the critical thinking that was presumably and the comparative sort of stuff. Is that, is that the sort of thing that's meant to happen in that? Yeah, and it's a, yeah, it's about sort of uh, testing your ideas yeah. and, your, and, and just your thought processes and whether or not they're, they're likely to be useful, or whether you've just gone off on a complete tangent that's got no bearing on the situation whatsoever. I think we always hope with these kind of tools it will generate the thinking, but some students will see it as these are the steps I have to go through. So the step they just come yeah. up with the students probably wouldn't think of for themselves yeah. to do it. So this says to you, make a pros and cons list of all the ideas you've come up with. Most wouldn't do it. Yeah. So when you've got something like this, you're exposing students to, I was answer these questions, I can move on. So yeah. it's like... And I think the little animation actually has another prompt because they, they kind of... S it's one thing to read about it, mm. but it's another thing to sort of see someone applying it and mm. seeing how they're yeah. thinking. It's almost like you need a question five, any other considerations? <laughs> yeah. You know, yep. Yep. Um, are you thinking of anything else that we haven't covered here? So an open kind of think a bit more yeah. might be useful. So have you actually tried this in the class? Mm. We used it uh, to a s small extent <laughs> um, yeah. in planning. I, it was just a bit of a trial and we did it quite late in the, in the plan, right? Whereas I'm going to bring it forward a bit and give them a bit more time. And the, we, we left it open with them. The couple of groups did go away and use it and came back to their progress meetings and said they really loved it. Um, but I think they were just at that busy crunch time. And um, if they'd had a wee bit more time and I'd slotted it into an earlier lecture, I might have got more out of it. So this year I will. <coughs> and um, because the, one, the two groups that did use it really loved it. Having, just having something to go away and sort of physically do. They didn't, um, they didn't have this big wall in front of them like, I've got to think of new ideas. They kind of had something to, to hang on to. Yeah. And it did help them uh, expand their thinking. Did you split the class? Well, the class was in groups anyway for the opinion. No, I mean, you know, some used it and some didn't. Well, no, we get left it open. And as I say, two groups really did take it on board and go away to and use it and then bring that back to their progress meetings. Hey, we worked with this tool and this is what we came up with. Um, so, yeah, I'd like them all to use it more. Well, why don't but you do an experiment and evaluate it? <laughs> well, mm. Just for the same thing. Yeah, yeah, they're all doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, judging for each other. That's the judgment sometimes. <laughs> you heard there's two. It's just it's two organisations in right. class. And two different organisations do this to come yeah. mm. But this year, I, I felt it was because I didn't allow them enough time. Yeah. It was when they had to, about 10 days off handing in, and it's a big project. Whereas I think if I'd introduced it a little bit earlier, mm. yep. and they had more time, then I think more would have mm. used it. Because as a process of just working through it as a student, I mean, they, they get to the, like, the first stage, and you know, sort of about thinking of really sort of blowing open their mind in terms of thinking about different sort of ways to even look at the problem mm -hmm. and that you know the first step of the first stage and that just seems absolutely daunting yeah. so uh, <laughs> it, 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 it has um, proven to be a little bit challenging in that respect 
but it's a disciplined process and you kind of need to go through those stages to get the benefit. It's really and important so, to make it visible, make the process visible. Yeah, yeah, so it would be, be really good if you could somehow link in their progress and they had a little progress bar so they kind of get some feedback all along. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it's quite, it's been, for a number of uh, places where it's been trialled, it's been quite difficult to run trials mm -hmm. because like Massey, a lot of uh, assessment is pretty well tied down. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, unless you can tie it to assessment, we know that students are less inclined to do it. So, and, and the other thing is you're trying to demonstrate the value of something in which they would not realise the true value until they've completed it. Mm. So you can say, oh, this is wonderful, you know, this is going to be really useful to you. And, and it's just trying to sell it. it. It's not an easy thing to do. But I think you could do that in painting because you only have one or two projects and mm. several groups doing the projects. And if you had brought in other people to be directors of the groups, the other groups wouldn't necessarily know that the certain direct directors were running them through this and others weren't. Yeah. So you do it as an experiment. And you could almost presumably, well, anyway, that's, that's just a thought. And as you know, that's the one thing that we struggle with in the marketing planning courses because at the end of the day, having done all the marketing courses, you get marketing plan and what do they do? Do lots of promotion and change the price. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So there's nothing to do with anything else they've done. They just yeah. make those fundamental things. There's, yeah. there's nobody... And getting them, to, getting them to actually be creative is yeah. a real challenge in that paper. I mean, it's just... Yeah. You know, the, the tendency is to you know, fall into those old traps. I'll just quickly go through the feedback in a yeah. second. So, 41% um, of the students took less than two hours before they felt confident using Ingenium, so that's sort of a, an idea that they, the students are picking it up relatively quickly. 60% um, agreed that it, that it helped them and uh, think creatively about the tasks they were given. Uh, one, of the, one of the outcomes of using Ingenium is actually to create some awareness about uh, creative problem solving techniques. Uh, this is an interesting part that we <laughs> Ingenium made them feel, uh, only 44% said it made them feel more confident about their uh, creative skills and this might have as much to do with the sort of the personal prejudice about one's creative abilities. Interestingly, uh, a lot of the design students felt that this was a complete waste of time. That, you know, I'm in design, I am creative, what are you trying to tell me how to be creative? So their own impression of their creative abilities was probably one of the stumbling blocks to get past. Uh, from teacher feedback, um, from a teacher's perspective, 80% it took half a day or less before they felt confident about teaching using it. So that's, there's a pretty quick uptake there. Uh, they also felt it was really useful in uh, raising awareness and practice. And across the board they felt it was relatively easy to use from their perspective. So, as part of this process and project, uh, I've got some little, uh, a very short three question uh, questionnaire. You're, you're quite, um, you're not forced to do this by any means. And you can fill it out online. I've put it in online there and you can pop it easily, fold it over and uh, my, my, uh, my details are on there. So, could you pass those out? Oh, it's massive. <laughs> the project was handsomely funded. <laughs> so, any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Well, I mean, you could take you could take the students a, a, a task and say, right, this is your task. Like, I mean, I really love that little one about the data because I could see I could set that, that kind of thing up as a presentation yeah. for a team and say, right, well, go through this <coughs> process as you formulate your presentation so that you can answer all those questions. So I could actually see how I could use that for a, for the team presentations I already do. And I could probably, this would aid some of those teams who don't really think that well and they just kind of slam things together rather yeah. than being a bit more creative about them. And if you get them in the early, it actually encourages them to really think widely about the task. Yeah. 
No, yeah, I mean, I could, often that's a real struggle for us is to sort of get mm -hmm. them to think of it well, other than just, oh, I've got to write an essay. Or, as you say, mm -hmm. get them involved in early, saying, right, these, these, you, these are your teams, this is your mm -hmm. project, and if you did that in the boat, like, second week of semester, they could be going away working through this. And maybe another way to maybe link it a little bit closer to uh, assessment is maybe getting them to provide a reflective statement at the end of each stage or something like that, just to sort of track their progress and maybe give them a little bit more incentive to, to do each stage. Well, one way of building in the assessment is, um, which builds from what you just said really, part of the mark is their insightful evaluation of the process they went in. Mm. We used to actually do that until we had to cut back on assessment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. after you've done it all, if you were to do it again, what would you improve? So it's a that sort of style of sort of... Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's really useful. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think that probably we ought to continue asking you questions off camera, as it were. Sure. Um, but I think that that was really great. Um, I don't know whether I'd feel any more creative after going through the process. <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, it's like having the systematic thing, and I can see how, how useful it could be. So thank you very, very much for opening our minds a little bit. <laughs>